We're at Wavelsburg Castle, renovated by Himmler to function as the beating heart of the future of the Aryan race. Had the Nazis won the war, they hoped to turn it into an axis mundi of a new homeland for the SS and the chief pilgrimage site of a religion of their own creation, Irmanism, its proximity to the Teutberg Forest and to Extern Steen, and the supposed site of the pagan tree of life factored into Himmler's decision to place it here at the center of Germany. He was also instructed by a man he considered his mentor, Karl Maria Willigut. Rather than discuss the symbolism found in these halls, I want to talk about Nazi racial prehistory, which was by no means a monolithic belief among the regime. The groundwork laid for these beliefs was set by Walter Dahr, an agricultural scientist born in Argentina. As the Reich Minister for Food and Agriculture, it's easy to gloss over his role in the war. He was an ideologue, but styled himself the Fuhrer of German peasantry and would be the chief of the SS Race and Resettlement Office up until 1938. His father was a hard drinker and womanizer who died when he was young. The family returned to Germany after World War I and Walter joined the Artemanen League, a youth movement representing the more conservative elements of the back-to-the-land ideas encouraged in post-Great War Germany. Hundreds of smaller groups joined the Artemanens, vegetarians, Volkish societies, ecologists, and alternative health professionals. They called for Lieben's reform, but had no coherent ideology aside from vague anti-Slavic sentiments until Dar rose to prominence within the League. This whole time he was working with them, he was also obtaining his PhD in animal husbandry and working as an unpaid farmhand in Pomerania, where he saw returning German soldiers mistreated. The Artemanen League believed that the only way to stop cultural Bolshevism was to leave the cities and settle the land to the east, an early version of Liebensprom. Members of the League saw their national duty as twofold, to be Werbauer, or farmer soldiers, and to violently oppose the Slavs. The League was settling thousands of members in Saxony and East Prussia as early as 1924 to prevent those lands from being settled by Polish folks. This was all observed by Walter Dar, who began to feel that farmers had a very real interrelation to the soil they tilled. He developed and put to paper the ideology of blood and soil, the belief in settling German colonists to a plot of land in Eastern Europe which they would be tied to by blood right, ideas which attracted the attention of fellow Artemanen member Heinrich Himmler. The two developed a very close friendship. Walter Dar's blood and soil ideas were intended to be a very long-term project designed to restructure farming to the old feudalist model. He argued that German farms were at one point in history bestowed to the strongest son to be passed down forever. At the end of feudalism, the inheritance would be passed down to multiple sons, the descendants of whom would ultimately sell the land off. Jewish or Slavic landlords would then buy up large tracts of land and employ the grandchildren of the strong warrior farmers as simple tenant farmers forever indebted to the landlord. Dar asserted that the peasantry formed the racial and cultural core of Germany as they were the descendants of the Nordic race. Through eugenics, the race of Germany could be guided back to that ancient ideal. By this point, Himmler and Dar were best friends. Dar had been granted the title of Chief of Race and Resettlement and had an SS membership number of less than 7,000. They began to look for esoteric guidance, someone to inform them of the ancient prehistory of the Nordic race. Himmler did what he did often and broke off to seek someone to validate his own ideas. That someone was Karl Willigut, Himmler's Rasputin. The two met in 1933, and Willigut told Himmler fantastical stories about his family's ancient blood feud with another figure of Germanic paganism, Guido von List. List was born to an upper middle class family in Vienna and refused to practice Christianity because he called it too weak. He instead practiced Wotanism, glorifying the Germanic version of Odin. At the core of his movement, he had a group of Ariosophists who worshipped the Aryan race. This group was called Arminists. Naturally, many early Lebensreform proponents idolized List, reading his musings written as he kayaked and hiked through the countryside of Austria in the 1870s. List only dabbled in anti Semitism towards the end of his career, in the early 1890s, when he began to lose his faculties. Around this time, he founded a literary club to promote the annexation of his native Austria by the German Empire. In 1902, he became very sick and for 11 months experienced a period of blindness. In his sleep, an ancient writing system was supposedly revealed to him, which he called Armenian Futhark. He prophesied that society would be destroyed in a great apocalypse, after which a new Germany would rise like a phoenix from its ashes. His supporters believed this to be the 
Great War, but he was crestfallen when Germany lost. He died a broken old man on a train to Berlin in 1919. He still had many supporters that would grow to prominence in the early Nazi party. His idea is that an ancient class of priest kings, the Armenian, had existed for many millions of years, were highly appealing to those who wished to show not only that the Germans controlled territories to the east, but that they had once ruled the entire world. As proof of this worldview, List pointed to Tacitus, who mentioned the Germanic tribe of Hermenones, the heirs to the Sun King. Their descendants formed the Armenenschaft, which operated in the shadows until Guido von List made their activities public. The religion designed by List was therefore twofold. The upper echelon of priests was instructed into the Armenian Orden, the secrets of Gnosis and Sun Worship. The lower classes practiced Wotanism, a simple religion designed for peasants consisting of folktales and fables. List claimed that the Armenian Orden functioned normally, if in secret throughout history, but that Wodenists were smoothly transitioned to Christianity, which preserved their customs and rituals. In his telling, the story of Jesus was a German one adopted by scald poets. For centuries, the Christians and Wodenists lived in harmony until Charlemagne ripped through the German countryside and embarked on a genocide of the Saxons. This is where modern-day politics came into play. To List, the Roman Catholic Church represented a continued occupation from the Roman Empire, a corrupt regime that subverted Celtic principles with papist teachings. In 1903, List submitted an article to the Academy of Sciences in Vienna, which laid out his set of Armenian runes, which he claimed formed a proto-language of the Aryan priest kings of Germany. Karl Willigut, however, begged to differ. Himmler could have just as easily attached himself to List had he not died in 1919, but Willigut convinced him that List was not only a charlatan, but a part of a cosmic conspiracy to destroy the Germanic way of life. It was in 1933 that Himmler was introduced to him, but he was immediately enthralled. Willigut was a boy when List was in his prime, and unlike Guido, he was a military man, serving all across Europe, where he joined various esoteric and volkish groups. Just as List began to write about runes revealed to him in his sleep, Willigut wrote his own treatise. He claimed to Himmler that his father revealed to him in 1890 that he was the last of the Willigotis of the Asa Uana Sipe, a lineage stretching back eons of mystical sages. He was able to access ancestral memories because of this lineage and claimed that Germany was first settled in 228,000 BCE by Atlanteans and that his lineage hailed from the mythical Shambhala-like city of Oral Eurovalis. He insisted that the New Testament was stolen from older Germanic sources and that the events, although true, actually occurred in Germany 14,500 years ago. Jesus Christ was actually Christ, an avatar that founded the Irminist religion around the ancient Irmin's soul, the pagan tree of life. Just a footnote, he was confined to a mental institution and declared legally incompetent before meeting Heinrich Himmler. Willigut therefore informed Himmler that the followers of Guido von List and the Nazi party were spies, part of that cosmic conspiracy to obscure the Irminist roots of Christianity. For Willigut, it was a war between Wodenism and between Irminism. List was, according to Willigut, the Wodenist clan that forced the Irminist sages from which he was descended into the forests of northern Europe around 1200 BC. These Irmin sages were literal flesh and blood descendants of the gods Aesir and Venir, who became ice kings and founded the city of Vilna as a capital for their Irminist religion. Himmler was a huge fan of fantasy narratives, of hidden secret societies, and of shadow kingdoms. The two became fast friends, and Himmler asked him to design a religious center around the new religion of Irminism. Before this could be truly completed, Willigut would embark on a few journeys through Germany, to determine where the energy lines of these still-living roots of the Tree of Life ran. These were mostly around Saxony, surrounding Externstein, the importance of which will become clear shortly. He also drew up a list of runes loosely based on Guido von List's runes, which he claimed were passed down to him directly via his grandfather, and not in a vision. Around this time, he began to instruct the fascinated Himmler on the renovations he should make to Wevelsberg Castle, including a floor of runes and paintings of Parsifal. A little more on the Irminist religion and the religion practiced in Wevelsberg. You can find here paintings of Percival. 
a figure that Himmler and Willigut were obsessed with. He featured prominently in The Legend of King Arthur as a knight raised in the forests, protected by his mother. He eventually ran away to become a knight and found on his quests the Fisher King, who was mortally wounded. His journey led him eventually to the Holy Grail. The allegory is that the Fisher King is indirectly a fisher of souls, leading figures like Galahad and Parzival to seek out the Grail and heal his wounds, saving the kingdom. The Grail represents eternal life and was to Himmler not a physical object, but a sacred bloodline. Thus, Himmler and the SS considered themselves on a sacred knightly quest to preserve the bloodline of the Nordic race. To symbolize this, Himmler created the Black Sun in the North Tower of Wavelsburg Castle with a dozen spokes to represent the Twelve Apostles of Christ the Earmanist or the Twelve Knights of the Round Table. Rooms were named after these legends, including the Grail Room and the King Arthur Room. Himmler and Willigut loved all of this, but to what extent Walter Dar participated in the more esoteric occult is unclear. His brother-in-law, Manfred von Nebelsdorf, took command of the castle in January 1934 and was replaced by Himmler himself in September of that year. Hitler, for his part, seemed totally ambivalent to the whole project and never once visited the castle. Willigut and Himmler were now tasked with providing a veneer of officialdom to their projects. Himmler was looking for proof of Willigut's Irmanism and to back up Dar's agricultural theories. By 1933, his Rasse und Rom and Blut und Boden theories were enshrined in law. So Dar and Himmler left Willigut behind in his castle and approached a historian named Hermann worth whose story deserves to be told from the start. He was the face of at least attempted legitimacy. Prior to the Great War, he studied Flemish philology in Belgium and Germany, earning a doctorate in 1911. Worth settled into a life of writing Flemish folk music, lamenting the loss of Dutch customs, and teaching Flemish Dutch at the University of Berlin. There's some indication that he was dabbling with esoteric ideals at this point, but up until the Great War, he seems to have mostly just been a normal professor. This made him use to the Germans once the Great War began. He volunteered for service and was assigned to monitor Flemish separatism. Hermann Wirth was assigned to monitor them because he understood the culture from its very bones and spoke the language fluently. One gets the impression he was sympathetic to their cause, but still favored a greater Germany. From 1914 to 16, Wirth performed these duties for the Kaiser until his dismissal. Wilhelm II personally appointed him to the title of professor and he traveled to the Netherlands where he began forming his own nationalist groups. He and his wife founded a Cell of Wandervogel organization, direct translation, The Wandering Bird. These groups drew inspiration from medieval wandering scholars protesting industrialization by hiking and communing in the woods and singing folk songs. They promoted pan-Germanic esoteric thought. Because of his wandering, Worth found jobs throughout the Netherlands as a teacher, but never really settled down. His career at this point parallels Walter Dars, both being obsessed with land reform and idealized agrarianism. In the early 1920s, he relocated to Sneek, a village on the Frisian coast of the Netherlands. It's there that his nationalist ideals truly crystallized. Here he found the Oralinda book, which deserves a few minutes of discussion on its own. The reason being is because it contributes directly to the pan-Germanic esotericism that was espoused by the SS with Himmler's permission. In 1867, Cornelius over der Linden handed a manuscript, Het Oralinda book, over to Elko Verwies, the provincial librarian for Frisia. He claimed the book was ancient, copied by hands from previous works, and that it had been passed down to him by his grandfather. Verwies looked Linden in the face and said he'd been presented with a forgery and refused to publish the book. Understand that Frisians were the butt of a lot of European jokes owing to their living in swamps and marshes and their exaggerated sense of national pride. To be handed a manuscript which claims to be thousands of years old and told that it's proof that Frisians were the seeds of the Aryan race would naturally put any librarian on high alert. Many scholars think it was Linden himself who forged the book, and others say it was the librarian, although that makes no sense considering he refused to publish a Dutch translation. More than likely, if the book were forged, it was the work of the preacher-poet Francois Haverschmidt, who had lived in Frisia for some time and worked with both the librarian and Linden. Father Francois liked to write serious poetry, but occasionally would write elaborate tongue-in-cheek mystic poems to satirize the chauvinism springing up around Europe. When doing this, he would always use a pseudonym. 
It just so happens that the preacher knew the Frisian librarian as well as Linden. He may have written the book and handed it to the gullible but friendly Linden with instructions to never show the librarian, telling him it would blow the lid off of Christianity. It was, after all, a biblical parody made to poke fun at Christian fundamentalists. Linden, of course, dutifully presented it to the librarian, who laughed at him and declined to publish it. However, a member of the librarian staff by the name of Jan Gerhardus Odema was fascinated by it and translated the work to Dutch, publishing it himself. Jan gave copies to his friends, who were members of the respected Frisian Society for History and Culture. Any questions they had about the authenticity of the manuscript were overshadowed by the intriguing contents for several years, and it may be the case that they were just glad to put Frisia back on the map. I would compare it to a late 19th century Bosnian pyramid hoax. Herman Wirth, of course, received a copy and was captivated. He had already developed a deep conviction that society as a whole was a scourge to Nordic culture and deeply desired a return to the land, to the Bronze Age, if not earlier. But the Oralindus spoke to his sense of German nationalism as well, alleging that all Germanic languages were descended from Old Frisian, that Frisians were the descendants of refugees who fled Atlantis, that they were governed by a hidden virgin priestess clan, that the practice of primitive did away with the need for any form of representative government and that the society of the old Frisians could be used as a basis for modern living. The book also claimed that all great cultures, especially the Greeks and the Phoenicians, had a language derived from old Frisian, which was itself derived from the sun wheel, similar to the theory of how the Armenian alphabet is based around the swastika. It seemed tailor-made for Worth to suggest that the progenitors of the most respected ancient civilizations to ever exist were refugees from the sunken Atlantis, and that society was a simple but ultimately pointless diversion from peaceful, racially pure living. He began to preach the Oralinda in his scholarly circles, believing in the book's authenticity until the day he died. With these ideas in mind, he joined the Nazi party in 1926, but withdrew again two years later. Worth didn't seem to be particularly anti-Semitic, but it has been argued that the philosophy of a return to nature is usually rooted in a desire to see non-agrarian cultures slowly fade away. He would later rejoin the party, but as far as Nazis go, he was one of the least insidious. In 1928, he published an essay in German, Prehistory of the Atlantic Nordic Race, which piqued the interest of Volkish activists, including Himmler and Dahr, who followed Wirth's career closely over the next few years. However, in 1933, he joined the SS and was re-awarded his first party number personally by Adolf Hitler himself. Worth tried to act as a middleman to disaffected pastors and religious people dismayed at the shift in religion and explained to them that Christianity was only a mystery religion, shielding Nordic mythology, which at its core was polytheistic, a la or a Linda. Having seen enough, Himmler demanded to meet with the man. It's at this 1935 meeting that the Ananerbe was established, where we really see how Himmler could string along historians. Accompanying Himmler was his personal friend, Walter Dahr. Worth was tasked with providing historic proofs and interpretations of the type of government and religion that should be employed in the land opened up to German settlers in the East. His esotericism gave him tunnel vision, and he didn't realize what he was being strung along with until he was in neck deep. Only a year later, in 1936, Himmler began to eclipse Worth's leadership in the Ananerbe with his own assertions. Now, 1936 held a very special meeting for Heinrich Himmler, marking 1,000 years since the death of Henry the Fowler, the first king of Germany. Germany. He actually made a pilgrimage to his tomb at Quedlinburg Abbey to mark the occasion and asserted that he was the reincarnation of Henry the Fowler, the king of East Francia, the first medieval German state. This was a slap in the face to Worth, but it's possible that Himmler didn't even understand this. It was the Franks, although not under Fowler, who defeated Frisia when it was at the height of its power. After 1937, Himmler stepped in and declared Worth the honorary president of the Ananerbe, giving himself, an uneducated chicken farmer, full control of the team of scientists and archaeologists. He began emphasizing Frankish and Far Eastern esotericism and entertaining Worth's expeditions to Northern Europe less. Carl Willigut prodded him along with stories more fantastical than Worth could have ever dreamed. These tall tales led Himmler to gravitate towards Wavelsberg Castle, which he believed was the beating heart 
of Aryan Germany. The Annan Air Bay was steered to investigations of Extern Stein as the location of the Ehrman Sol. Pivotal to these experts was Wilhelm Tote, a former colleague of Hermann Wirth's. Wirth published articles in Wilhelm's magazine, but after the Nazi seizure of power, the two became competitors. Tote increasingly sought proof of Ehrmanism, often pointedly disproving his former comrades' assertions of the Oralinda book's validity. Like Karl Willigut, he claimed to have special senses that could lead him to great discoveries. He was able to sense vibrations, so he said, that led him to Externstein, where he could visualize the ancient tree of life, literally and metaphorically. The first thing he observed was the Externstein relief, a fascinating carving dating back to the 12th century. Alrighty, so actually seeing this carving here, it's pretty big. I wasn't expecting it to be this size, but um, it's the largest carving of this kind north of the Alps. They said it was probably 12th century, and uh, you can see Jesus is being lowered from the cross by Joseph of Arimathea. And Nicodemus, who discussed religious matters with Jesus and defended him at his trial, can you see what he's standing on? It looks a whole lot like the uh, Tree of Life. I think they said it's the Earman soul or the Earman, and he's standing on top of it. And that's what made it a lot of people who were in the Volkish movement think that perhaps this was a site of worship for the Earman, that the Tree of Life was here, and that this was carved kind of to represent Christianity defeating that. Now, a lot of people think it's just a stylized palm tree, or that it could be an odd depiction of a chair, which is weird because the earliest uh, coat of arms for the Ananerbe was the earman that is being stood on by uh, Nicodemus, but upright and straight and growing again, representing like the rebirth of the German people. But if this is actually just a palm tree, they just took a petroglyph of a random palm tree and made it the lifeblood of their people. What Tote and modern neo-pagans consider important about the relief is the fact that Nicodemus is standing on the Ehrman soul to bring the teachings of Jesus to the world. It represents a victory over the pagan shrine believed to be on the site. The Nazis truly believed that the tree of life, the Ehrman soul, was right here at Externstein. Detractors to this theory claim that the figure could simply be a stylized chair or or a palm tree. However, Nazi authorities bought into Wilhelm Tote's theories, and the first seal of the Ananerbe depicts the Ehrman soul standing tall and full of life. On Tote's orders, a sacred grove was erected on the site, and tourist infrastructure was destroyed. Here's some unusual info on Externstein from a quick tour. And on top of the sandstone pillar is probably the most significant part of this, apart from the relief, is the Pohenkammer, or the High Chamber. There's an apse here with what looks like an altar. Slots indicate that there would have been a wood wall or roof over the top. And the hole here roughly aligns with sunrise at the winter solstice. What makes this an odd place for a Christian burial in the 3rd to 4th century AD is the fact that it was on the edge of the Teutberg Forest where the Romans were famously defeated in 9 CE. So the legend says that this place has been used for Christian worship since the 8th century, and yet there's pagan symbolism everywhere. And then there's this burial from the 3rd to 4th century. So could it be a folly that was made at a different point centuries later in a style of a tomb that was popular for, you know, the 3rd to 4th century? Why is it outside? Most of these tombs are found inside of catacombs and in Rome. Doesn't make any sense to be right at the base of these pagan sandstone pillars. Know what happened to all of these characters once the war was over? Himmler, of course, died mysteriously after the war, and I recommend watching the Mark Felton series to learn more. Wilhelm Tote was ejected from the Ananer Bay in the late 1930s by Himmler for being overly chauvinistic and quarrelsome, and died in 1942 as an old man. His theories about Externstein continue to be promoted by some neo-pagans. Hermann Wirth lived to old age and briefly found some sway with the New Age and Native American movement in the 1970s before losing favor with them as well. 
Walter Dar was sentenced to only a few years in prison after the war and drank himself to death in 1953, much like his father. Carl Willigut was increasingly pushed out of Himmler's inner circle and died suddenly of a heart attack at a refugee camp in 1946. The epitaph on his tombstone reads, Our life passes by like idle chatter.